Queen. Can the people online hear me? All right, let's start. The next talk is Matthew DiMeglio, and it's going to talk about bypassing Solar's theorem, the key to axiomatizing dagger categories of finite dimensional Herbert spaces. Please take it away. Thanks, Paolo. And thank you to the organizers of the conference for putting on an awesome week and to the program committee for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is joint work with uh, Chris Honan. It fits into the larger picture of uh, axiomatizing uh, dagger categories of Hilbert spaces. But before I get on to exactly what I'm going to tell you about, maybe I should give you some context for why I'm talking about this at an applied category theory conference. So quantum mechanics is founded on the theory of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps. And uh, there's this thing called the quantum reconstruction program, which is about finding more intuitive mathematical foundations for quantum mechanics. Often people are looking for sort of axioms that have some kind of physical interpretation or something that, yeah, some, something more intuitive. Um, and there's this category theoretic approach, which started, I don't know, about 20 years ago now, uh, focused on these categorical structures like dagger categories and monoidal categories. Uh, and the I, the, I mean, a very high level idea behind what, what, what we're trying to do in this setting is to identify the essential structures and properties you want to, of, of the category of Hilbert spaces that can sort of capture the, the essence in an abstract way. Uh, and I mean, this is quite vague, but some of these, these ideas should, should eventually inform the design of programming languages for quantum computers, which is something that uh, Chris has done some work on as well. So, um, what I'm going to tell you fits into the framework of this result by Chris and Andre, so Chris Honan and Andre Cornell, uh, from a few years ago, which I think is quite a surprising result. So it's a characterization of the category of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps in terms of axioms that are quite natural in a category uh, theory setting. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain a bit about uh, the, the, the axioms here. So it says that a monoidal dagger category, so if you don't know what a dagger category is, it's a category with an identity on objects anti-involution, so contravariant endofunctor. And the idea is this contravariant endofunctor is encoding the Hermitian adjoints of bounded linear maps in, uh, as structure on top of the category. And then we add some additional uh, uh, assumptions. So uh, we assume that finite dagger byproducts exist. So these are byproducts that are compatible with the, the, the dagger in the appropriate way. And in particular, because they're byproducts, they give us an enrichment of our category in the category of commutative monoids. And then we assume that dagger equalizers exist. So these are equalizers that are also dagger monomorphisms. Uh, dagger monomorphisms are the abstract analog of isometries. Uh, so you can sort of capture what it means to be an isometry in terms of the, the dagger. And we also assume that the monoidal unit is simple, which means that uh, every sub-object of the monoidal unit is either an isomorphism or its domain is zero. And what this gives us uh, in terms of, uh, is, is it, it gives us the fact that the, so the, the monoidal unit, which in the category of Hilbert spaces is just uh, the, the scalar field regarded as a, a one-dimensional vector, vector space. Um, so in this case, the monoidal unit, you can look at the endomorphisms on the monoidal unit and normally they'd form a monoid, but with the enrichment in commutative monoids, they, they form a, a, a semi-ring. But with these additional assumptions, you can prove that this, this actually forms a field and that the field is of characteristic zero. So we're getting closer to, to um, I mean, so Hilbert spaces are usually done over uh, the, re the reals or the complex numbers, or you can also do them over the quaternions. And so we're getting, these, these assumptions are getting us closer to, to, to that. And then the final assumption is the thing that actually gets us the, the, the completeness of the scalars. So, uh, but this is, this is the, the tricky bit. 
So somehow this, this final assumption, which is that the wide subcategory of dagger monomorphisms, I told you the dagger monomorphisms are the, the abstract notion of isometry, has directed co-limits. And somehow these directed co-limits are encoding some kind of uh, completeness with respect to some uh, canonical order that, 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 that's on the, the, the scalar field. And there's some assumptions that I've omitted, but these are the, the, the main ones, and these are the ones that, uh, that we're kind of interested in today. And so if we have all these assumptions, then our monoidal dagger category is equivalent to the dagger category of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps. So to give a bit more context for what I'm going to tell you about today, I need to tell you a little bit about how Chris and Andre proved this result. And the, the, the sort of key magic uh, ingredient that, that I think does a, a lot of the hard work is this, this uh, theorem called Solis theorem. So I'll first tell you what the theorem says and then how, how they use this theorem. So it says, let X be an orthomodular space. Okay, so here's a word that probably most of you haven't heard before. Uh, it's not really important for the, the purpose of this talk, but you can think of it as an, uh, a, a generalized notion, sorry, a generalization of the notion of Hilbert space to arbitrary fields that aren't necessarily complete. So you don't have this, uh, so Hilbert spaces are, are complete, but in an orthomodular space, the substitute for that is this orthomodularity condition. It's not really important, but it's, a, it's something that's a bit like a Hilbert space. Uh, so let X be an orthomodular space over an involutive division ring K. And it turns out that if X has an infinite orthonormal subset, then this, this involutive division ring is actually either the real numbers, the complex numbers, or the quaternions, and X is actually a Hilbert space. Uh, and so this, this theorem, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice result. The, the proof is rather uh, uh, unintuitive, like there's a lot of fiddly calculations and things that don't really, I mean, they seem to come from nowhere, so it doesn't give you much, inf so you don't get much intuition for why why this, this turns out to be the case, but it's a very useful result. And the way that Chris and Andre use it in their proof is, uh, so you know they have this monoidal dagger category and they want to prove that the field of endomorphisms on the monoidal unit is, uh, is either the real numbers or the complex numbers. So what they do is they form this directed diagram of dagger monomorphisms. So you have the monoidal unit, the monoidal unit direct sums with itself, the monoidal unit direct sums with itself three times, and you have the inclusions. So the inclusions of the um, uh, uh, isometries, the, the dagger monomorphisms. So this is a directed diagram in the, the wide subcategory of dagger monomorphisms. So by the, the last axiom I told you about, it has a, a co-limit. And this co-limit you should think of as being uh, the analog of uh, the space of square summable sequences in, in, the, um, in the concrete setting of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps. So I've written suggestively L2 of I. And the point is that uh, they, they can show that L2 of I is an orthomodular uh, space and these uh, in, injections into L2 of I give you an infinite orthonormal subset and from that they can deduce that this uh, scalar field is either R or C. H is eliminated because it's commutative. So this is this is a sort of a high level picture of how Solar's theorem is used in this 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 proof that these axioms that you recover the category of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps. And I mean it's all very good, but it would be nice if we had uh, a clearer understanding of how these directed co-limits give rise to the completeness of the scalar field. And it would also be nice in, a, in, a, in another way is, so I mean, it would be, so uh, in quantum computing, we're, we're dealing with finite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces by and large. And so it'd be nice to have an axiomatization of the, the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And in this category, we don't have objects like this L2 of I, because L2 of I is inherently infinite dimensional. So if we want to axiomatize FD Hilb, uh, this, this uh, appeal to Solar's theorem isn't going to work. So the goal then is to prove that this scalar field is either the real or the complex numbers without appealing to Solar's theorem. And the main 
sort of result that's, I guess, the thing that we're going to appeal to that's replacing Solar's theorem is this result about Dedekind sigma complete partially ordered fields, which is, uh, I mean, similar to a number of results about complete ordered fields, but this is the one that's uh, uh, useful to, to, to us. So it's by Demar from 1967. So what, 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 what is this about? So a partially ordered field is uh, a field equipped with a partial order and it satisfies some axioms. So the, the non-negative elements should contain one, should be closed under addition, multiplication, inversion, and every element should be a difference of non-negative elements. So that's what a partially ordered field is. Dedekind sigma complete says that the, the non-negatives have infima of non-increasing sequences. So if I have a non-increasing sequence of uh, non-negative uh, uh, elements of the, of the field, then, then that, an infima of that, that sequence should exist. So, so this, this result says if I have one of these things, then it's actually isomorphic as an ordered field to the, the field of, of real numbers. So how, how can we use this result? Well, the first thing is we need to show that our, our scalar field is an ordered, is a, one of these partially ordered fields. So, uh, if, well, in particular, the scalar field could be C, and C is not a partially ordered field, but if we restrict, restrict ourselves to looking at the self-adjoint elements, then that should be the, the analog of R, which should be a partially ordered field. And indeed it is if we define the partial order in this particular way, so we say that uh, A is less than or equal to B if and only if their difference is of the form X dagger X for some morphism X into some other object of the category. So X dagger X, so, so okay, a morphism from, the, from I into some object X you could think of as essentially being a, a vector in X and X dagger X is like the norm squared of X. So in other words, we're saying that the positive things are like the norm squares of vectors into into to other objects. And so, I mean, you can check the, the axioms of a, of a partially ordered, ordered field. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details uh, much, but I will say that the fact that the product of two positive things is positive is using the, the tensor product, whilst the sum of two positive things is positive uses the fact that you can take the product pairing of, of, of these uh, vectors. So, so this is the first, the first step. So we have a partially ordered field, and the, the, the tricky thing is proving that it's uh, Dedekind sigma complete, that we have in FEMA of decreasing sequences of, of positive uh, elements. So this is the claim. So we claim that this, this field of self-adjoint elements is Dedekind sigma complete if the wide subcategory of, of uh, contractions as directed co-limits. So this notion of contraction in this abstract setting is, is uh, not something that people have really considered before. So the definition is that it's a morphism F from X to Y, such that there exists some other morphism F bar into some other objects, so from X to Y bar, such that if I do F dagger F plus F bar dagger F bar, I get the identity. So in other words, you can pair F with some other morphism to make it into an isometry, into a dagger model morphism. So this, this, this definition corresponds to the notion of, uh, the, the familiar notion of contraction if you specialize to the category of Hilbert spaces and bounded linear maps, which is what, what you want. So, and I should say, so this, this assumption is a slightly stronger assumption than the one given in the, the, the axiom, the one, the, the one in the axioms that Chris, Chris and Andre gave, which was about the wide subcategory of dagger monomorphisms rather than the wide subcategory of contractions. So if we have this, this assumption though, we can prove that, uh, that this, this field is static and sigma complete. So we need a little lemma, and the lemma says that if A is positive and non-zero, then it's of the form X dagger X for some isomorphism X. So all the positive things are the form X dagger X for some arbitrary morphism X, but if A is non-zero, then we can assume without loss of generality that X is an isomorphism. And the way the proof goes is, well, so A is positive, so it's of the form Y dagger Y for some uh, 
uh, morphism Y from I into Y. And uh, sorry, uh, yep. And so A, A itself is an element of a field and it's non-zero by assumption, so it's invertible. So we can form this morphism Y, Y dagger, Y inverse, Y dagger, and you can sort of check that Y is then uh, an equalizer of this morphism and one, but by assumption, uh, this, this parallel pair has a dagger equalizer. So a dagger equalizer is an equalizer that's also an isometry. And then because we have two equalizers, there's an isomorphism between them, and this isomorphism makes the triangle commute and sort of putting that information together, we can conclude that A is actually equal to this isomorph isomorphism followed by its dagger. And so it's of the form X dagger X where X is an isomorphism. So, so this, this, this proves the lemma and this lemma is going to be important in the proof of this, this main result. So let's, let's prove the main result. Um, so we need to show that every decreasing sequence of, uh, of positive uh, scalars has, has a greater slower bound. And if at some point in the sequence we hit uh, zero, then, then from that point onwards, the rest of them are going to be zero and the infimum is going to be zero. So we can assume without loss of generality that all of the scalars in our sequence are non-zero. And by the previous lemma, we can thus assume that these, these xj's are actually isomorphisms. So I've depicted our sequence of vectors here. Now, because they're isomorphisms, we can consider sort of doing uh, x1 inverse x2 and x2 inverse x3, and we get these morphisms that make this diagram commute. And the claim is that these morphisms at the bottom here are actually contractions. And so that's uh, easy enough to check using the, the, the way, laws of the way the inequality is de defined. So we see that uh, if I do xj inverse xj plus one followed by xj plus one dagger and then xj inverse dagger. This is less than or equal to the identity. And so this thing here is a contraction. And so we have this uh, directed diagram of contractions. And so by our assumption, uh, it has a, a co-limit and the comparison in the, the wide subcategory of contractions. So these are all contractions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let x be the composite of x1 with this morphism here, so that this morphism here is x1 inverse x. And then I can prove by induction that the, the, uh, the jth one is x, xj inverse followed by x. So, so I can actually put labels on all of these morphisms here. And then the, the next step is we want to show that actually uh, if I do x and then x dagger, that forms a lower bound on this decreasing sequence. And so how does that work? Well, we sort of play around by inserting an xj and an xj inverse that cancel each other. And then we use the fact that these morphisms here are contractions uh, to, to get the fact that x dagger x is less than or equal to xj dagger xj. So we've shown that x dagger x is a, is a, is a lower bound on this sequence. Okay, so we now need to show that it's a greater slower bound. So suppose we have another scalar, positive scalar, y dagger y, where y dagger y is less than or equal to all of the elements in our sequence. Then we can compose with the, free compose with the inverses of these xj's to get these morphisms here x1 inverse followed by y, x2 inverse followed by y. And again, using the laws of the inequalities, we can show that these morphisms here are contractions. And so because of the universal property of x, there's a unique comparison morphism f that makes the relevant parts of the diagram commute, and f is also a contraction. And then there's a bit of algebraic manipulation again to show that uh, x dagger x is greater than or equal to y dagger y, which then means that uh, uh, x dagger x is the greatest lower bound on this sequence. And so that finishes the proof that, that, the, the, uh, that we have the Dedekind sigma completeness. 
So the, the main result then is that this, this field of scalars is either the real numbers or the complex numbers if the wide subcategory of contractions has directed co-limits. And the proof sort of starts by appealing to DeMar's theorem, which I mentioned at the start, to deduce that the self-adjoint scalars are isomorphic to R. And then the rest of the proof is quite straightforward. You could either use some Galois theory if you, if you know that, or you can prove it directly. So if, if they're, so either, I is equal to I self-adjoint, or there's some element that's not in the self-adjoint uh, uh, scalars, and then you can define this, this I to be this thing here. So this thing on the bottom here is a, is a positive scalar, and because we already know that the self-adjoint scalars are R, it means we can take the square root of it, and then you can show that I squared is minus one, and that one and I form a basis for I over the self-adjoint scalars, and that then means that I is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Um, so that, that, that finishes the, the proof of the, the whole thing, and that also more or less finishes my talk. So there's one sort of a lingering question, which is about the fact that we had to strengthen the assumption from directed co-limits of Dagomonos to directed co-limits of contractions. So it would be nice if one of these implied the other. Uh, so if the, the directed co-limits of Dagomonos implied the directed co-limits of contractions, so we wouldn't need to sort of strengthen this assumption. And then I guess I should say something about where, where this is going. So these ideas uh, are useful when you want to axiomatize uh, category, uh, dagger categories of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces because you can then sort of play games where you control uh, the, uh, the, the kinds of diagrams for which you want to ask for the, the directed co-limits and using these ideas. So Chris, Andre, and I are working on uh, Hilbert space, sorry, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and linear contractions. And at this point, we have a, a draft of a, of a paper, so hopefully we'll have something out on the archive sometime soon. Uh, and Chris and I also have ideas for how to adapt this to do uh, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and arbitrary linear maps, and that's something that uh, we will hopefully get around to writing out once we finish the, the contractions thing that, that I just told you about. So that's where I'd like to, to wrap up for today, and thank you for your attention. All right, uh, thank you. And are there any questions? We have quite some time. Yes, one there. Thank you, uh, lovely stuff. Um, I'm wondering within this, this category without assuming you know, your results, are there some uh, nice ways of characterizing projection operators? And in, in particular, recovering some of the now kind of old quantum logic approaches to talking about the orthomodular structure of projections. And, and if not, not starting trying to prove this result, but at least to get at some of those, those ideas, like in, in Bardarajan's Geometry of Quantum Mechanics, where he uses that that logic to more or less say yes you're working over Hilbert space over the complex numbers sure if i understand the question correctly it's can we can we talk about projection operators in this abstract uh, categorical setting and i think the answer is yes and this is talked about in a number of different works in the literature on dagger categories so you want to look at these things called uh, dagger idempotents so they're uh, like an endomorphism on, on an object that's idempotent and also is self-adjoint in the sense that it's equal to its dagger. And these things are the abstract analog of projections. Well, just saying, because I mean, it was, uh, the projection operators, I, I wouldn't be surprising. But like I said, there are these approaches to, to try to say that you're in a category of Hilbert space over the complex numbers that start from the logic of these projection operators. I'm just wondering if you could cast that in this setting? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure how to answer that, but maybe we can discuss it a bit more afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Any more question? There was somebody there, maybe? Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, your last remark was about you've got ideas for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and arbitrary linear maps. Um, are you able to give us a quick hint about what they're like? Is it very different? 
Uh, no, I mean, so most of the axioms would end up being similar. We're going to have to go from the axiom about um, uh, directed co-limits of dagger monos to something else. It's going to be in terms of contractions. The issue is we don't want to allow all directed co-limits, otherwise we would get the infinite dimensional things, but there's this idea about sort of talking about either like bounded directed co-limits where you use some kind of thing to bound. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm just, it's be easier to draw some pictures and things, but there's, there's ways of ensuring that you're, you're not allowing directed co-limits of all diagrams to exist, but you sort of select out the ones whose co-limit would be uh, uh, finite dimensional mm -hmm. anyway. And that turns out to be enough, like, yeah. Mm. I think there's no kind of interaction between the boundedness that you want to put there and the fact that you want to do arbitrary linear maps, not necessarily bounded. That doesn't. No, 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 no. Great. Thank you. Um. Right. Thanks. Any more questions uh, for the in person participants? All right. It seems not. Are there any questions from the online participants? <clears throat> yes. Uh I do have okay. a question. Please. please go ahead. You could uh, couch uh, spectral theory in terms of uh, dagger categories in a nice way. So it was the question, can you do spectral theory of operators in terms of dagger categories? Aha, uh -huh, yes, I think you, you can, but uh, maybe it turns out quite nice. Or uh, have you been interested in that? I can say I haven't thought about spectral theory in this setting, but it sounds like an interesting thing to, to do. Um, perhaps we could talk about it. I'm not sure who's actually asking the question because I can't see At the moment. All I can see is my slides, but um, maybe, maybe you can get in touch via email or we can chat afterwards and have a talk about that. Yeah, no, sure. I recommend you write that on the Zulip uh, chat so that. The... Sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Sorry. Who? Who's asking the question? Okay. So, so from whom is the question coming? Okay. There's um, there's a, something in the chat. So Jorge was asking, is the field, I guess the field of scalars, not necessarily commutative, but that probably refers to an earlier slide. So is the question still a question or has it been answered during the talk? So because in the setting for this talk, we assume that we were in a monoidal category, uh, the fact that we're in a monoidal category forces the the ring of or the semi ring of endomorphisms on the the monoidal unit to be uh, commutative. Um, it's some I don't know. I think it might be an Ekman Hilton type argument or something in terms of the way that the composition of scalars is related to tensor products of things and yeah. I see. So that excludes quaternions already, right? It does. Right. Okay, that's it. Already answered. Okay, very good. Um, okay, any more questions? Seems not. So let's thank our speaker again.